goosebumps with this church, they're God bumps. And we will continue to have God bumps, won't we? And I think it's important for us to realize and know the God bumps. I got it on me right now, the Holy Spirit's here. And in doing so, uh, I tell you, I want to look a little bit deeper. I want to look a little bit deeper than the God bumps. And my title today is Basking in the Spirit. Basking in the Spirit. And as you can see up on the board, uh, we are going to reference several things that we can reference uh, and as reminders to us. Uh, we will be at Daniel chapter 6, verses 19 through 22. And you guys know that's Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel 3, 23 and 28. That's the three amigos. Matthew 9, 20 through 22. Mark 23 through 25. John 5, 8 and 9. And then we're going to finish with Luke 24, 32. So when you think about basking in the sun, you think about just being like somewhere where you're just absorbing it. And you feel the warmth. And you feel the goodness. Today's a beautiful day to be on a hammock. <laughs> yeah. It won't happen, but today's a beautiful day to be on a hammock. And just laying and absorbing the warmth of the sun and the beauty outside. I think it was I am. So it was a beautiful day. Every day is a beautiful day. When it's shining like that, it's a little more special, isn't it? So in doing so, uh, today what we're going to talk about is I'm going to give you some illustrations, some examples of basking in the Spirit of God. Not just knowing the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit's here. You guys know that. You guys, you guys know that as long as we have the Holy Spirit in us, Satan cannot abide in us. He can't. Because Satan cannot be in the same place that, that God is. That's why God kicked him out of heaven. So you can't, you no longer can be here. Listen, if we proclaim Jesus Christ and we proclaim that we have the Holy Spirit in us, Satan cannot abide in us. He can try. He can go around us. He can do things to try to deter us. He can try to beat us up. But guess what? He cannot win. He cannot win. And the reason why he cannot win is because we have the Holy Spirit in us. See, the Holy Spirit abides in this church. That's very prevalent. That's very obvious. And it's our choice on whether the Holy Spirit abides in us. It's our choice. This morning when you came in, what was your attitude? What was you thinking? I'm going to give you an example of one that isn't this way. We had a service one Sunday morning, and it was here at this church. And it was a very, I, I'm telling you, the Spirit was just jumping, you know? The Spirit was moving in such a mighty way. And right after the service, and, and I'm going to ask you with this, please don't do this. But right after the service, one of our parishioners cornered me because they had something on their mind that they just had to get to right at that moment. And my statement to that person was this. Did you even hear any of the message today? Because I'm going to tell you, probably not. Because probably what was happening, they were so bent on getting to me that they didn't hear a single word while the Holy Spirit was stirring just amazingly in the house. And really when we come, it's the, what we bring in is what happens here in this sanctuary. It is. We can either bask in the Spirit or we can come begrudgingly. That's why I said, you know, the Old Testament tells you 10%, 10%, 10% about tithing and giving. And again, we want, you know, that's encouraged to give 10% of tithing and giving. But what does Christ say? Christ says, be a cheerful giver. And you guys know how I feel about this. If it means that you can't give 10% because of other reasons, that's okay. Give cheerfully what you can give. But sometimes, it's not because of reasons. You guys have heard me. There's a difference between a reason and an excuse. Again, I'm way off my notes already. <laughs> you guys see my notes right now. None of this is in it. Uh, that happens about every other Sunday. But in doing so, seriously, we want you to be a cheerful giver. And if that means giving $5, that means giving $5. If that means giving $100, dollars hey. And if you want to give $1,000, even more, right? <laughs> the church will enjoy that. But as I say that, what I'm saying is this. Is the Lord wants you to be a cheerful giver. And the more faithful you become, what you're going to find out is it's easier to give. And as you will find out also, you know, you think, okay, well, this might be my last dollar. And then all of a sudden, something happens where somebody gives you a gift, a love gift. Or you get 
get a check in the mail that you weren't expecting. I have to tell you, one time Don and I, you know, we were giving and, and we were in straits. We were struggling financially. I happened to be while I was serving you for Christ. You would think that everything would be perfect, right? It wasn't. But we were struggling. And it was amazing. We got a check in the mail out of the clear blue that we weren't expecting. And it was a check that was enough to get us through. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. That part of being able to bask in the spirit is that we remove those other things that are going to deter it. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. And, and as I give you the references, you know, I, I, I have a couple notes here. One of the notes I put was this. To be absorbed in the moment. To be absorbed in the moment. You know, when, uh, when you, your favorite sports team is doing great, you get absorbed in the moment, don't you? You know, you, you just get absorbed in the moment. When something great happens with one of your children or your grandchildren, I don't know about you guys, but I get absorbed in the moment. Amen. Man, it feels good, doesn't it? And in doing so, what happens is we look at it and we just, you know, we just take it in. And we get absorbed in the moment. That's the way we need to feel about the Holy Spirit. We need to feel like, hey, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Receive me. May I receive you? And in doing so, just be absorbed in the moment. I, I put also, be enriched by the situation and the place that the Lord puts you in. And sometimes those aren't easy, are they? Sometimes we say, hey, Lord, where you at? The Lord's still with us. I thought it was me that I, I heard the Lord didn't leave. I did. The Lord was still there. I thought, what do you need to say? Right? So be enriched in the place and the situations that the Lord has put you in. So I want to I wanna reflect on a few examples of people that were basking in the Spirit. Okay, the first one is Daniel chapter 6. Verses 19 through 22. And it says this. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting uh, voice to Daniel. I remember, before this all happened, the king says, Daniel, I hope your, your God is, is going to, to appear for you. I'm praying for you. And he actually said, I, I think he will. You know? the, the king was saying that before all this happened. And then he says, the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And when he was questioning that, because of what had happened previously, what it tells us was, he wasn't saying that sarcastically. He was saying that with hope. Isn't that true about our whole life as a Christian? Isn't that what it's about? It's about hope. And he said it with hope. And he says, did your God, did your God, who you serve, serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. We just seen yesterday, Charles became king. And God, uh, one of the things that the English always say is God saved the king. And I thought that was interesting. Isn't that similar to what he's saying there? He says, may the king live forever. <laughs> and he says here, um, I lost my spot, I'm sorry. Oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they not have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. It doesn't matter what man thinks, does it? What we need to know is that we're innocent before our living God. It doesn't matter what man thinks of me. It doesn't matter what man thinks of you. What it does matter is what God thinks of you. Amen. And in doing so, we need to look at that. He says, hey, he found me innocent. And also, O oh king, I have done no wrong before you. I found no wrong before you. You know, I think at that moment, at that moment, Daniel was basking in the spirit, don't you? Man, I could just see it, man. I Man, Whew. <laughs> you know, he's basking in the spirit. He said, okay, it's okay. It's okay. 
King, it's okay because you know why? Because I was found innocent by the Lord. I was found innocent by the true King. So it doesn't matter. And then he goes on and says, you know, I forgive you, King. That's really what he was saying. He said, I forgive you, King. And in doing so, you know, I can, I, I can just imagine, you know, one of the things that I think I would ask is I'm sitting inside this, this lion's den with the lions not being able to eat me and the angel standing before me. I don't know about you guys, but I think one of the first things I would say is, hey, what is it like in heaven? What do you? I would think, you know, I'm sitting there with this angel and it's like, man, this is too cool. You know, what is it like in heaven? Because don't we wonder a little bit? We got all these descriptions, but I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I even dream about it. What is it going to be like in heaven? That angel knew. He'd been there. You know, or she'd been there, whichever the case. They'd been there. And in doing so, it was so cold. And he sits there, and he's in the presence of God's angel. He's in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy God that we serve. He's basking. In the spirit, isn't he? Wow. You know, there's a couple of things that I would say about this, about Daniel, is that he had great faith and he trusted in the Lord. See, because when Daniel went into that lion's den, Daniel knew that he was in a win-win. If he come walking out, guess what? He won. If, they, if the lions ate him up, guess what? He won. Daniel couldn't lose. Daniel could not lose. He was in the win-win. No matter what happened that night, no matter what happened that night, Daniel won. See, we might lose a couple battles here as Christians. We might. But guess what? We already know who has won the war. Amen. That's us. That's us. We've already won the war. So as we go into battle each and every day, God tells us to put on the full armor of God. Again, we got him off on a rabbit trail, but that's okay. Uh, and God tells us to put on the full armor of God. Guess what? There are some days where we don't put on that full armor, is it there? And sometimes we get beat up. But we know. We know who has the victory. Amen. That's Jesus. And as we look at that, we look at Daniel 3, 23 through 28, and it says this. And these three men... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <coughs> fell, down, bound, uh, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They were wrapped up, bound up, tied up. The king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of this fire? Now let's stop for a second because what they did was before they threw them in, they turned the furnace up seven times more than they had ever had it. And the men who threw the three men in did what? They all got consumed by the fire. Now all the men that were around, all the soldiers that were around that threw them in, every one of them died. Instantly. But not our three guys, did they? No. And he goes on to say, weren't they three men? And weren't they bound? And the answer said to the king, true, O king, look. He answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. <laughs> wow. Walking in the midst of the fire. <laughs> and they are not hurt. And, and the form of the fourth one is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, this is the king. And what, was, what did he just say? Servants of a God? The Most High. The Most High. Not one God, not some God, but the Most High God. We serve the Most High God, and he serves us. And we need to realize that he does serve us. And we should be <laughs> That should be exciting for us. And he says, um, <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, 
and the satraps and the administrators, governors, and the king counselor gathered together. And they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. See, Satan has no power over us as long as we continue to live in the Holy Spirit. Amen. I really believe in my heart, you guys have heard me say this a lot lately. A lot. And I believe American Christians have lost the fact that we have the Holy Spirit and Satan cannot. He has no power over us. He has no power over us. He can try to beat us up. He can give, get at us health-wise. He can get at us sometimes emotionally. But guess what? As long as the Holy Spirit is in us, he can't defeat us spiritually. He cannot. And he goes on to say that he says, um, there's no fire and they had no power over them. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments even affected. The smell of fire was not even on them. Steve, you do fires. Does the smell of fire come upon you when you're sitting around the fireplace? You betcha. It wasn't even upon them, right? I can't even see my notes right now. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. You guys get that? Who trusted in him. All right? And he goes on and he says, uh, and they have frustrated the king's word <laughs> and yielded their bodies that they not serve nor worship any god except their own god. See, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of confusion. There are a lot of people being but we have the answer. We have the answer. Listen, this meet King Nebuchadnezzar was angry because they wouldn't serve him. He was angry. He threw them in the furnace as hot as he could get it without the furnace blowing up. Probably should have had seven times the regular heat. And this is what happened. But what happened was there was a change of heart by Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because of the faith and the trust of those three men. Trusting God, trusting God, trusting God. You know, if we would just trust in Him, it doesn't matter. Again, what did I just say about Daniel? Those three guys, when they were thrown in the furnace, guess what? You know, it didn't matter. They won. They won. You know, I can, I can almost picture it. I can almost picture it. Those four guys in there, the three guys in the angel, and I can almost see them dancing around inside the furnace saying, you can't get me, you can't get me. You know, when a little kid, you know, the little kid stands there. You guys know, you know, your grandkids, your kids, and they stand back and say, you can't get me, you can't get me, right? And I can almost see those four just say, you know what, that's what I'm you can't get me. Why? Because the angel of the Lord appeared upon them. They were basking in the spirit of God. They were basking in the Spirit of God. You know, I can give you three or four or five more Old Testament stories of where we can relate to that. Can you imagine Moses in the mount? He comes down and his hair is white. Why? Because the Spirit of God is upon him. He's the only one that's even seen a glimpse of God. He's the only one. Can you imagine when God calls out of the grave and says, come out? I would say they were basking in the spirit. But I want to give you a couple of New Testament uh, stories real quick. And uh, they on normal looks wouldn't be these major events. Let me start with Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. And it says, and suddenly, I love this story. And suddenly, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. A flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. She didn't approach him and didn't come to him face to face. She just touched the hem of his garment. Why? Because she had enough faith that she knew if she would just touch his, the hem of his garment that she could be saved, that she could be healed. And it says, go on, it says, for she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your 
faith, your faith has made you well. You are healed because of her faith. See, God isn't asking a lot of us. He's not asking us to jump through hoops. He is asking us to serve him. He is asking us to go make disciples. He is asking us to witness to others. He is asking us to try to live a righteous life. He's asking those things, but that's not bad. That's not hard. He's not asking of anything major of any of us. This woman who had bled for 12 years, and her faith was enough to, hey, I don't even have to talk to him. All I have to do is, I don't even have to touch him. All I have to do is touch his garment. And he said, because of your faith. Because of your faith. You don't think at that moment when that blood stopped, that woman wasn't basking in the spirit? Man, I could just, I could almost picture there was a glow about her. Have you ever noticed that when somebody has come to a, just a great meeting place with the Lord, that you look upon them and, and it's almost like there's a glow upon them? I could imagine this, the other people were standing around him. At first when he said, who touched me, who touched me? What did his apostles say? Hey, we're in a crowd, everybody's touching you. And you know, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Somebody touched me. Because I could feel the spirit come out of me. All we have to do is call out to the Lord. We don't have to see him be in his presence. All we have to do is call out to him and have faith and trust in him. The woman was healed instantly. Mark 23, 25 says this. It said that Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the disciple, the child cried out and said with tears, what? Lord, I believe. In the second part, what did he say? He said, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. See, God knows that we have uncertainties. God knows that there are situations that we're not sure of. And we're thinking again, Lord, where are you at? Where were you at in this situation? <coughs> and he said to the man, all you have to do is believe and all things are possible. He didn't say one or two things, did he? He said all things are possible. And the man says, Lord, I believe. But then he was honest, wasn't he? He was honest and he said, Lord, I still have some uncertainties. I believe in you. I trust in you. I love you, Lord. I believe that Christians uh, do feel that way. I know that the people that come in this house feel that way. I know that. But you can't tell me. You can't tell me that there are times of uncertainty. And if you were to tell me that, I would tell you that you were probably lying to me. Because all of us have those moments of uncertainty. But what he said was, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Take away my uncertainty. Take away my unbelief, Lord, that I could just be firmer and stronger in you. I'm telling you right now, the, man, the man's child was healed. And what do you think was happening in that man? That man was basking in the spirit. This wasn't no great thing of being thrown in the first furnace. This wasn't no great thing about being thrown in the lion's den. This wasn't no great thing about going up in the mountain and getting the Ten Commandments. This wasn't no great thing about walking out of the uh, out of the tomb alive after several days. This was a simple man asking Christ, please, Lord, show mercy on my child. Please, Lord, show mercy to me. Listen, that's all he's asking of us, is to be of that same heart, that same passion, and that same desire to serve him and want to be of him and to trust in him. That's what he's saying. He's saying, trust me. Trust me. And if you will trust in me, what I will do is I will take you to a place where you can bask in spirit. I don't know about you guys, but I really believe that this church, because the Holy Spirit is in it, here is a place where we can bask in spirit. Yeah. What do you got? Help, I believe, he cried out. Help, I believe, Lord. Make me certain. Make me certain. You know? Meg, I know you're here, but I want to share just for a second. As I said yesterday, I would share and I've shared it with you guys before. I don't understand all the things that happen in life. 
I don't understand that she lost her brother at age 46. He was too young. I don't understand that. I don't understand. Eight months ago when I did the 22 month old funeral, I don't understand this thing. I wish I did, but I don't. No, I wish I don't, because <laughs> I don't want that upon me, actually, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I, what I do know is that I can trust in the sovereign God. I can trust in the Lord. I can trust in Jesus Christ, my Savior. I can trust in the Holy Spirit that Jesus said, as I leave, I'm going to leave you with something <laughs> that can counsel you, that can guide you, that can lead you. That's what he said. He left us with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells right here in this house this morning. It does. <laughs> Help my unbelief. John 5, 8, 9 says this. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Hey, this was a paraplegic, a common man. This wasn't anybody that was just major, you know. He wasn't a counsel to the, to the king. He wasn't Moses. He was a common man. But what I want to tell you guys is this, is that there are a couple things that are magnificent about this story that we need to understand. One is that the man was healed. He couldn't have been healed if he didn't have the faith that Christ would heal him. But more importantly is that he would have never got in the presence of Christ if it wasn't for the faithfulness of his buddies of his friends, of his church friends, because that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to rise up and lift up one another. We're supposed to be here for one another. We're supposed to help one another. And if it meant going on top of a rope and tearing through the thatch, I don't know if you guys have ever seen thatch or not, but it's not pretty. It's all dry, hard dirt with sticks mixed in and stones mixed in it. Can you imagine? I, didn't, I don't think they brought shovels with them. So these guys are on top of this house and they're digging with their hands and their fingers and tearing their hands up, trying to get a hole big enough to lower their buddy in front of Christ. And they just so happened to position it to the point that when they lowered him, where was he at? He was right in front of Christ himself. Wow. You think that was a coincidence? You guys know what I believe in coincidences. There is no such thing. But yet what he's saying here is this, is that he says, take up your bed and walk. Rise up. He's telling us today, he's telling us to rise up. As Christians before him, we need to rise up. As his brothers and sisters of one another, we need to come across beside each other and help each other out. It's not hard. It's not hard. And I'm thankful, I'm thankful that this church does that. I don't want to say that you guys don't, because you do. You guys are so good. All right, and help one way or another, help another. Let's continue to do that. Let's stand in the gap for those others. You guys have heard me say before, don't give up on your loved ones. Don't give up on your family members. Don't give up on your friends. And you are the only God they know. And you are the conduit between God and them. And guess what? If you give up, then where is the conduit between God and them? It's gone. Where is the connection between God and them? It's gone. Because they're not going to seek the Lord themselves, but they may seek the Lord through you. Continue to do so. Don't give up on your loved ones. Don't give up on your loved ones. This, that story just amazes me for the four friends. So what I want to do is I want to share this. And this is what we've addressed so far today. And we're almost done and then we'll go into communion. Again, if you can't make communion, we understand. Okay. Put our levels with you either way. It says here that I broke down several things. Faith. We must have faith. Trust. Trust in the Lord. Obedience. That's where you really start getting deep is when you become obedient to the Lord. And sometimes you do things that you don't even want to do. Sometimes you do things that you don't even want to do because you're being obedient to the Lord. Not giving into temptation. Remember? 
kings tempted Daniel. The king tempted the three men, right? He tempted them. Do not give in to temptations. Christ was tempted by Satan himself. Isn't that crazy? And last but not least, let's be willing to stand in the gap for others. I want to share one more story with you guys, and then we'll close this portion of the service. Luke 24, 32. It says this, and they said to one another, this, this story, you know, I said about the way being touched. This story just amazes me. <laughs> and they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while we opened the scriptures to us, listen, those two men that were walking in Emmaus, my desire for each and every one of us here is that our hearts will burn because of the scripture of God, because of the word of God. They said, man, did our, man, did our hearts burn? Listen, I want each and every one of us to have a burning heart. I want us, our, our hearts to be, I want us to bask in the Spirit of God in such a way that our hearts burn, that our hearts burn, that we are on fire for the Lord. You know, the two guys, the Lord appears out of nowhere, and you've heard me say before, it was miraculous, and I, I gave you an illustration a few weeks ago, I'm not going to do it again, but he appears to them, and he's sharing with them, and says, what did he do? He went directly to the Word. He went directly to the word. He wasn't ashamed of the word, was he? He said, as, they, as he shared the scripture, our hearts were burning within us. As he shared the scripture, our hearts were burning within us. And then what did they do? You guys remember what they did? Did they go home? Nope. They went back to Jerusalem. They started telling everybody in the town, guess what? Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And then they, after they went to the town's people, as they worked their way through the town, they got to the house where the apostles were staying. <coughs> they went in and they said, guess what? Jesus is alive. And remember, the apostles didn't receive him at first, did they? Like, these were guys, these were the guys that walked with Christ. And they weren't even understanding. Those two men understood why? Because they were basking in the Holy Spirit. That's why. See, they understood. They were basking in the fact that they were in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And they went. They didn't go home. They went back to Jerusalem. They could have been put in prison. They could have been killed. They didn't care at that point because you know why? I'm going to go back to it again. They were in a win-win, weren't they? Listen, as long as we have the Lord in us, as long as we are living in the Holy Spirit, no matter what happens to you in this life, guess what? You win. Amen. You win. No matter what happens, you win. And in doing so, these two men, man, I, again, can you imagine? You're walking with him and you're asking questions and it's like, yeah, and he asked them questions. And, yeah, man, we couldn't believe that the guy died. We thought he was going to be our king. You know, we can't believe that he didn't make it. We thought somehow or other people would come in and rescue him. Guess what? He got rescued. And today, each and every one of us know that we can be rescued. This time we're going to sing a song before we go into the communion <coughs> service. And at that point, if you do need to leave, please leave uh, uh, quietly. If you don't need to leave, if we can move all to one side, which is almost the point where we need to do both sides pretty close. Right? And then, uh, one of these days, we're going to be all the way.